Welcome everybody to today's edition of the EV Journal Club. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Jose Angel Nicolas, uh, who's coming to us from Spain and specifically at the Spanish National Center for Cardiovascular Research. Um, so uh, Angel had a paper recently in the journal Cell um, that looked at how EVs can contribute to mitochondrial homeostasis in the heart. Um, and so he's gonna be presenting this work to us today. And I'd like to ask that everybody um, please put your comments and your questions into the chat box and then we can have a nice uh, discussion with Angel at the, end of the, at the end of the presentation. So Angel, welcome. And we're looking forward to very much. hearing about your work. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking you, Ken, by, uh, for the invitation. And um, we were talking a little bit at the beginning. Uh, one of the things that are more, uh, mm, uh, let's say, interesting for me about giving this, uh, this journal or presenting this paper here is because we usually don't get uh, too much feedback, feedback from the extracellular vesicle world. So I will love the, the discussion with you. So yes, I can say before, I come from the National Center of Cardiovascular Research in Madrid, and I work in Andres Hidalgo Laboratory. And um, uh, this is the paper that I will be presenting today, A Network of Macrophages Supports Mitochondrial Homeostasis in the Heart, that uh, has been published in Cell in September, if I remember properly. And uh, since uh, the paper is quite long, I will try to reduce it uh, to the minimum uh, <laughs> indispensable to, to understand the, the, the main message. And uh, I would like to start just by thanking all the people that have collaborated in this project that, as you can see here, is a lot. And uh, especially Ana Victoria Lechuga, who is a co-first uh, author of this work. And she has helped us uh, mostly with uh, all the um, experiments uh, related with mitochondria, measuring mitochondria function in different uh, models, etc. And also to many, many people uh, from all around the world that uh, have uh, helped us in different parts of this project. So uh, I will do a brief introduction about macrophages because I don't know to what extent you are familiar with them or not. And macrophages are immune cells defined by their high phagocytic activity. So every day in healthy tissues, there are a lot of cells that undergo apoptosis. And these apoptotic cells uh, release fine me signals that uh, call the macrophages. So the macrophages detect these apoptotic cells. And one, uh, once they are in contact with the apoptotic cell, they are able to recognize them through different uh, IPMI signals. Uh, once the macrophage internalizes the material of the apoptotic cells, this uh, causes a response in the macrophages of regulating different anti-inflammatory uh, cytokines. It, and this is very important because when um, when this process fails, the material inside the apoptotic cells can be released to the media and cause inflammation. So the macrophages have uh, multiple roles, both in immunity and homeostasis. Uh, some of the, these roles in immunity will be, for example, antigen presentation, but in homeostasis, you have phagocytosis, wound healing, and a bunch of uh, different functions that are collectively named as the tissue resident uh, or tissue specific functions. These uh, functions are performed by tissue specific, uh, sorry, by tissue resident macrophages. These uh, are populations of macrophages that receive normally inside the tissues. So for example, in the brain, you have the microglia, which are on charge of performing synaptic remodeling, and also they promote uh, neuron survival. But uh, you, in other organs, like the lung, you have alveolar macrophages that participate in surfactant clearance. So there is a whole, a, a lot of uh, populations of macrophages residing in the uh, tissues in a steady state, and the heart is not an exception. It was described in 2012 that there is a population of macrophages residing in the myocardium, and uh, by this time, uh, the role of these cells was completely unknown. So the main uh, question that we have when we started this project was uh, try to define if these uh, cardiac resident macrophages have a specialized role uh, for, the, for this organ. So I will start uh, with, the, with the figures uh, one by one. 
but uh, I have uh, skipped a lot of uh, supplementary results and, and other stuff because the paper is too long. I will try to focus more on the part that I think that is more interesting for you, which is the part uh, where we describe these uh, cardiac exophores. Uh, but yeah, if you have any doubt about uh, what, uh, whatever other cell of the paper that I, that I have not commented here, please feel free to, to ask uh, uh, by the end of the presentation. So first, this is the way how, how we define the, the macrophages in the heart. We just follow a strategy that has been uh, um, defined previously by other labs. And we name collectively to these three macrophage subsets as a total population, the cardiac macrophages. I will refer to, to, refer to those uh, as a single population for, uh, to make this easier. And uh, we know that these macrophages express GFP protein in the CX3, CR1, GFP report in mice. So we decided to use uh, these mice to define uh, where the macrophages were located in the tissue. To do that, we clarify the whole organ, the whole heart of, uh, of these CX3, CR1, GFP mice. And as you can see here, we could uh, analyze the distribution of macrophages all around the, the organ. Uh, here you have a density map, and uh, as you can see, there were not um, differences in the distribution of this population. They, they are distri distributed homogeneously through, through the organ. Then uh, we use this model here, the alpha myosin CRE ERT ROSA26 tomato mice, to just induce the expression of uh, tomato fluorescent protein in some cardiomyocytes. We, achieve this just by using low tamoxifen doses. So as you could see here, if it works, I think it will work, yeah. So just by applying low doses of tamoxifen, we are able to recombine only some of these cardiomyocytes and along with uh, staining for macrophages in green here, uh, we are able to quantify the number of contacts uh, between these two cells. So if you look uh, here, I think that the video will close up in this one. So you can see that uh, each cardiomyocyte is uh, establishing contacts with several macrophages at a time. So in the case of this one, there are up to one, two, three, four, and five. Hmm. We have uh, done a quantification of several of these cardiomyocytes and we found that uh, in fact, in average, each cardiomyocyte established contact with uh, five uh, macrophages and each macrophage at uh, 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 establish uh, contacts with up to five different cardiomyocytes at the same time because they have long protrusions similar to uh, dendritic cells or astroglia. Next, since we knew that macrophages were expressing the CD169 uh, DTR marker and it is quite specific for macrophages within the cardiac uh, populations, we decided to use the CD169 DTR mice to uh, eliminate these cells. So just by giving diphtheria toxin to these mice, the diphtheria toxin will enter into the cells expressing CD169 and will eliminate them. As you can see here, just by giving a consecutive doses of the diphtheria toxin, we were able to achieve an 80% reduction in the numbers of these cells that we can maintain up to three weeks. So we decided to explore what happened to the mice when we eliminate the cardiac macrophages. And first, we, we did a proteomic study. A, Strikingly, what uh, first appeared to, to be clear in these mice was that something was happening uh, related with mitochondria. As you can see here, most of the proteins that were changing in, in the absence of macrophages uh, were related with mitochondria function, oxidative phosphorylation, TCA cycle, or fatty acid oxidation. First, uh, further, when we analyzed the tissue of these mice by transmission electron microscopy, it was clear that the cardiomyocytes were accumulating mitochondria that, uh, that were bigger and also have reduced a uh, area of crystal. So they have reduced crystal density, as you can see here. This was already announcing that this uh, mitochondria will probably have problems in, in uh, doing ATP synthesis. So we measured this uh, in different uh, experiments by different uh, techniques. But I just showed you here the production of ATP ex vivo. Uh, with mitochondria from these mice. And as you can see, it is reducing the presence of different uh, substrates. 
And this, um, <clears throat> since the calcium insights are not able to obtain ATP normally through oxidative phosphorylation, we decided to check uh, for the uptake of glucose with analogous FDG, uh, glucose analogous FDG. And we find that the uptake of glucose in these mice is increased, probably indicating that they are doing a metabolic switch through a more uh, glucolytic metabolism. Finally, we measure the function of uh, the heart of these mice by different ways. I just show you here the echocardiography. We also did uh, um, hemodynamics. But uh, mainly what happened to these mice is that the, the heart shrinks. It becomes smaller. They lose left ventricular mass, which is reducing uh, with time, as you can see here. And also, there is a progressive decrease in diastolic function measured by the EA ratio, and also um, impairment of the systolic function. Here is not evident because there were no changes in fraction shortening or ejection fraction, but uh, with the hemodynamic study, it becomes uh, clear. So next, uh, in the second figure, uh, we start uh, just by asking what uh, would be a possible role for macrophages in the, in the heart. And as I told you at the beginning, macrophages are known to be a professional phagocyte, uh, phagocytic cells. So first we isolate the macrophages from the tissue and we found that effectively they were containing these large vacuoles indicative of uh, uh, phagocytosis or active phagocytosis. And we decided to check uh, this by, by using this strategy. So we analyzed the phagocytic capacity of macrophages just by exposing them to different cell sources, which are expressing a, a red fluorescent protein. So macrophages will, will not have any expression of a red fluorescent protein, but through phagocytosis will incorporate this material and become uh, fluorescent. So I think that here is clear. Uh, we first took um, DS red mice, which express DS red protein in all their parenchymal cells and perform bone marrow transplant. So here we radiate the DS red mice and insert the bone marrow of a CD45.1 mice. As you can see here, the cells that we transplant do not have any red fluorescence, but when they are exposed to the parenchymal cells expressing the red fluorescence, they are able to uptake them, as you can see here. So next, we decided to ask specifically which uh, cell type uh, were the macrophages eating. So just to make the long story short, we check, uh, we found the macrophages to phagocytose material coming from circulating cells by using parabiont uh, system. Uh, we found the macrophages to uptake material coming from endothelial cells just by using a uh, CRE specific for endothelium and to induce the tomato fluorescent expression on the endothelium specifically. And finally, we found that macrophages were able to uptake material coming from cardiomyocytes. Here we use the alpha myosin heavy chain CRE, which is specific for cardiomyocytes in combination with ROSA26 tomato, just to have red cardiomyocytes. It's the CARRED model that you will see all through the presentation. So when we get this result, uh, it was uh, kind of puzzling for us because it, it has been proposed that the cardiomyocytes uh, uh, even if they have very low rates of renewal, uh, you mostly have all the, all the cardiomyocytes that you obtain when you are born. So all this material incorporated by the, by the macrophages should not come from the apoptosis of cardiomyocytes. It has to be something else. So we moved to immunofluorescence, and what we found was that in the extracellular space of this, uh, in the extracellular tissue, sorry, of these uh, mice, uh, there were the presence of these uh, small particles that were expressing uh, the tomato fluorescent protein, so they were from cardiomyocyte origin, and they were uh, in contact or totally engulfed by the macrophages, indicating that these uh, particles uh, is the source of material that the macrophages uh, were eating. So here you have a reconstruction of these exophers, uh, so the, uh, these particles that we call cardiac exophers, from cardiomyocyte origin and how they are uptake by macrophages. I will show you here a video of one of these reconstructions where you will be able to see both the cardiomyocytes and cardiac exophers in red. Uh, here you have the cardiomyocytes and you can see how several of these small particles can be, can be observed in the tissue. And in green, you have the macrophage. 
So the video will focus in this macrophage here that is in, uh, in contact with one cardiomyocyte and has already uptake one of these particles, as you can see here. So we quantify the, the size of these particles and uh, the exophers have in average uh, 3.5 micrometers of diameter. So they are uh, much larger than uh, the size which is proposed by, for exosomes, for example. However, they are still much smaller than, uh, than macrophages. So macrophages do not have any problem engulfing these particles. And uh, we did a quantification. We found that, uh, let's see if there, I can find my pointer here. Yeah, we see that up to 40% of these particles have been already a are already in, court, in contact or have already been engulfed by a macrophage in the tissue, as you can see here. So this exchange of material is quite uh, is quite high. And uh, I just wanted to comment that we use the term cardiac exopher because by the time we did this uh, this finding, uh, there, uh, a paper uh, came out in Nature from Monica Driscoll lab, where they show how the neurons from C. elegans were able to produce extracellular vesicles very similar in size to, to what we were observing in cardiomyocyte, and also share other, other particularities with, uh, with the cardiac exophers that I will show you later on in the presentation. So that's why we choose this, this name. So next, what we decided to do was to explore the content of the cardiac exophers. And uh, here we have been uh, developing a protocol to isolate the cardiac exophers uh, uh, by doing a, uh, enzymatic digestion of the tissue and a serial centrifugation steps just to enrich the sample in particles uh, that, that were about the size of the exophers that we identified by immunofluorescence, and we use the tomato signal in the car red mice to identify them and sort the, the cardiac exophers uh, in, uh, in suspensions. So we are preparing a, a de description of this protocol to be published in, uh, in Celestar protocols. It's currently under review, but probably will be published by the beginning of next year, if you are interested. So uh, when we perform proteomics on the isolated exophers, the first thing that we realized was that the content was quite varied. We could find there proteins belonging to mitochondria, sarcomere, cytosol, and many other cell compartments. However, it was, it was quite a stri uh, a striking that the proteins from the mitochondria were uh, greatly enriched in the cardiac exophers when compared with uh, total cardiac tissue. As you can see here, from mitochondrial proteins, the vast majority of them were enriched in cardiac exophers, where proteins from other cellular compartments uh, were there, but not uh, specifically enriched. So next, we move to transmission electron microscopy, and we were able to identify these structures surrounded by, by membrane and containing several mitochondria at once. We also confirmed the presence of mitochondria in cardiac exophers by immunostaining and uh, also with different molecular proofs uh, for detecting mitochondria in our cardiac exophers preparations for fax. Next, we just do a, a panel of different antibodies to check the presence of proteins belonging to uh, mitochondria, sarcomere, peroxisome, etc. And we found that effectively uh, the, pre the presence of all of proteins from all these compartments, uh, it's uh, positive in these cardiac exophers and at different proportions. It's something that uh, uh, we are also interested in. It seems that the content of the particle varies depending of, on the necessities of the tissue in each situation. So next in the third figure, we try to, to um, assess if the, the cardiac exopher work as a mechanism to transport material from the cardiomyocyte to the macrophage, and specifically mitochondria. Uh, when we were analyzing the tissue of uh, wild-type mice by transmission electron microscopy, we have been able to identify mononuclear cells 
containing uh, mitochondria inside phagosomes at different stages of degradation. And this mitochondria by size and morphology seem to be from cardiomyocyte origin. So we decided to test this with two different models. So first we generate this complastic bone marrow transplant model in which we have a, a mice with a C57 mitochondrial DNA that we irradiate and transplant with the bone marrow of a mice that have a different mitochondrial DNA, but the same nuclear DNA. This, in, this is important because this allows us to do the bone marrow transplant, but then we can identify the source of the mitochondrial DNA. So when the system, this is the final system where we will have cardiomyocytes from the recipient expressing the C57 mitochondrial DNA and the transplanted macrophages that will have the NZB mitochondrial DNA that can be uh, differentiated by uh, BAM uh, digestion. So we isolate macrophages from different tissues of these mice, and we found that specifically in the heart, we could detect uh, high amounts of uh, exogenous mitochondrial DNA, indicating that these macrophages were taking mitochondria from some parenchymal cell uh, in the tissue. Uh, this seems to be quite specific to the heart. However, we, we found that in the skeletal muscle, something seems to be happening uh, there too. And we are currently exploring this in the lab. So next, just to be sure that uh, they, they were the cardiomyocytes and not any other parenchymal cell, we developed this model in which uh, we use a viral vector, which is the ABB9, uh, containing this plasmid here. So here uh, we try to express the chema fluorescent protein with a tag to guide it into the mitochondria. And uh, we control the expression uh, just in the case that the ABV9 infect any other cell that is not a calumeocyte. We control the expression of chema with a cardiac troponin promoter, which is uh, very specific for calumeocyte. So, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, in this system, uh, you can see that after five weeks, uh, so five weeks after the infection, we start to see the mitochondria labeled with the chema. And when we question for macrophages, you can see that part of this uh, mitochondria labeled with chema have traveled into the, into the macrophage, indicated that this transfer of mitochondria is, is occurring. And finally, when we isolate macrophages from both the chema model and the complastic model, we found that uh, the the protein and the mitochondrial DNA is degraded in macrophages uh, just uh, a couple of days after the uptake, indicating that these uh, exophores containing mitochondria uh, are going to be degraded in the macrophage and not used for the macrophage uh, uh, purpose, just uh, because it has been proposed that uh, different cell types can exchange mitochondria in different situations. So uh, yes, moving forward, uh, now, uh, I want you to, to focus on this. I told you at the beginning that uh, in the cardiac exophers, we have an enrichment of a mitochondrial, sorry, in the cardiac exophers, we have an enrichment of mitochondrial proteins. However, there were some of them, which are the one marked here with an asterisk, that were uh, significantly less present in cardiac exophers. And those were related with the mitochondrial fitness, such as FIS1, which mediates the mitochondrial fission, OPA1, which, my, um, which is related with mitochondrial fusion, and some of them like cytochrome C or apoptosis inducing factor mitochondria 1, which escape from mitochondria when the mitochondria get damaged. So all of these were indicating that the mitochondria inside cardiac exophers uh, will probably have some degree of damage. And also by the transmission electron microscopy, it was quite clear in some cases that the mitochondria uh, were heavily impaired morphologically. So we did a, um, we divide the mitochondria within cardiomyocyte in different regions, uh, perinuclear mitochondria, intermiofibrillar mitochondria, subsarcolemal mitochondria, mitochondria in the border of the cardiomyocyte and mitochondria inside the exophores. And we score these mitochondria as normal or abnormal based on the integrity of the uh, external membrane and also the density of crystal. As you can see here, when we did this quantification, it was quite clear that since we, so when we move to the border of the cell, uh, 
the quality of the mitochondria is getting lower. And when we move to the exo, uh, to the exophores, the vast majority of the mitochondria there is showing clear signs of, uh, of damage. Finally, we use the mitonier to, to measure mitochondrial membrane potential. And we found that the mitochondria inside these exophores were not responding to the polarizing or hyperpolarizing agents, indicating that the, the capacity of these mitochondria to maintain the membrane potential is almost uh, zero. Uh, next, we decided to explore a little bit the mechanism of production of these uh, exophores. And um, since we find the, the mitochondria uh, to be one of the main cargo and also that the cardiac exophores contain proteins from different compartments, we hypothesized that maybe they will be related to the autophagy system. As you probably know, autophagy is an ancient system that mediates the disposal of several intracellular components. And uh, normally here, there are a lot of uh, proteins that, that mediate uh, air either by recruiting the cargo or uh, participating in the maturation of the phagophore. But uh, here we decided to study the role of rapamycin, which is an mTOR inhibitor and works uh, increasing the autophagy flux. Uh, we study LC3, which is one of the main proteins related uh, or involved in uh, cargo recruitment to the phagosome and the uh, ATG7, which is one of the molecules medi mediating the maturation of LC3, necessary for binding to the phagophore. So first we uh, generate uh, the carved mice with um, um, a fusion protein for LC3 with GFP. And we found that uh, the cardiac exophores were containing LC3 by both immunofluorescence and by fluorescent uh, and by, and by fax. Next, by um, administrating uh, rapamycin to these mice, we found that uh, upon rapamycin treatment, we have more exophores in the tissue, and this uh, um, correlates with higher uptake of cardiomyocyte derived material in uh, cardiac macrophages, but also cardiomyocyte derived mitochondria by using the KMA system. So when we activate autophagy, we have more transfer of material from cardiomyocyte to macrophage. And when we do the opposite thing, we just uh, eliminate one of the ATG7 alleles, in, specifically in cardiomyocytes. We have a heavy reduction in cardiac exophore presence in the tissue. And also, again, this correlates with less uptake of cardiomyocyte derived material uh, in macrophages and also less uptake of cardiomyocyte derived mitochondria with the KMA model. So in this case, when we block autophagy in cardiomyocytes specifically, we have reduced transfer of material from cardiomyocytes to macrophages. So next, uh, we decided to explore what happened to cardi with cardiac exophores uh, in, the car in the cardiac macrophage depleted model. Because uh, as, you, as you have shown at the beginning, all part of this story begin with the depletion of macrophages. So we wanted to know what will happen with this structure in this situation. So we just did a short uh, depletion experiment. And here we found that two days after depletion of macrophages, cardiac exophores start to accumulate in the tissue. However, when we maintain the depletion up to day 21, the cardiac exophores start to disappear to a point in which we could not even uh, detect them in the, in the tissue. And you have the quantification here. These correlate uh, with a total blockade of autophagy flux in, uh, in cardiomyocytes of these mice, again indicating that the autophagy and cardiac exopher production are somehow related. And another thing that was quite clear in these mice by transmission electron microscopy was that uh, upon macrophage depletion, the tissue of these mice started to accumulate a lot of debris in the intracellular space, including uh, free mitochondria, as you can see in this image. And free mitochondria are very well known for being one of the strongest activators of the inflammasome, uh, either the mitochondrial DNA, but also ROS and other peptides from mitochondria can activate an RP3, which in turn activate caspase-1 and the maturation of IL-1-beta. 
and part of these uh, proteins uh, are also known to sequester or inhibit uh, proteins of the autophagy. So if the inflammasome get activated, the autophagy will be inhibited. And here we found that as early as day seven in depletion of macrophages, we have a strong activation of NRP3 and uh, increase in cleavage caspase one, indicating that uh, this uh, accumulation of debris was activating the inflammasome. And when we block the activation of the inflammasome with drugs as the NCC 950, we, were, we have been able to partially rescue both the autophagy flux in cardiomyocyte and the production of cardiac exophers again. So indicating that uh, when you deplete macrophages, material that start to get accumulated in the tissue, this activate inflammasome and the activation of the inflammasome somehow blunt the production of new exophers, probably through the in inhibition of autophagy. So I just jump to the final figure, just to do this not uh, too long. Uh, in this last part, what we wanted to assess was trying to detect some kind of mechanism by which the macrophages are able to detect the cardiac exophers and eliminate them. So uh, this uh, we first tried to, to check for uh, phosphatyl, uh, phosphatyl serine exposure in cardiac exophers, and we found that effectively the cardiac exophers were presenting phosphatyl serine in the membrane. Uh, phosphatyl serine normally is maintained in the inner leaflet of the, of the cells, but when the cell entering apoptosis, this phosphatyl serine is moved to the uh, outer leaflet, and this is recognized by macrophages either directly or indirectly with different uh, protein receptors. Receptors. One of these receptors is MERTK, that uh, is known to have roles uh, in macrophages in the heart uh, during myocardial infarct. So uh, we just confirmed that macrophages in a steady state also express the MERTK and the nuclear regulators of MER. And uh, we analyzed what happens with the uptake of cardiomyocyte derived mitochondria in MERTK no knockout mice. And we found it to be strictly reduced. However, it's not zero because it's uh, well known that macrophages have many uh, different receptors to recognize apoptotic cells. Uh, but some features that these MERTK knockout mice share with the depleted mice is that they started, they also accumulated material in the extracellular space, <coughs> correlating with an activation of the NRP3 inflammasome, and again, a uh, reduction of the autophagy flux in cardiomyocytes. Finally, we also find that the uh, mitochondria uh, of these mice, of the MERTK knockout mice, have a reduced crystal density and reduced ATP production that gets uh, it's, uh, clearer in older mice. This is something that also happened with other features of MERTK knockout mice that become blind with age, uh, they are sterile, etc. And uh, finally, uh, again, this reduction of uh, the oxidative phosphorylation in mitochondria correlates with an increase in the uptake of FTG in these mice and a reduction of the diastolic function. So this is the model that we propose with this data. In a steady state, the cardiomyocytes will uh, um, pack part of their material, including mitochondria inside these cardiac exophers that are released to the extracellular space and can be detected uh, by macrophages through phosphatyl serine and MERTK. Uh, once recognition, uh, macrophages internalize and eliminate these particles. And when you deplete macrophages or they have deficient phagocytosis by the lack of MERTK, the material will start to accumulate in the extracellular milieu, activate the inflammasome and block the production of new exophers uh, by the in inhibition of autophagy. I haven't shown here, but we also have some data in the paper uh, with different cardiac stress models that uh, increase the production of these particles. And we know that at least ATG7 is uh, participating uh, in the production of these uh, particles. So I think I will stop here and I will be, be glad to answer, answer your questions. Ankel, thank you so much for that very clear presentation. Um, we do have quite a few questions that have come in in the chat box. Some of them have been answered along the way, I think. Um, but I wanted to start with one from, uh, from Phil, who um, I don't believe he's on the call anymore, but he, um, his question might be one that 
um, that also applies to others. So he asked about how the tamoxifen was going to identify the cardiac macrophages. And what the answer was, was that it was used to, to label the cardiomyocytes. But maybe you just want to comment on that use of tamoxifen so that, so that um, people on the call who aren't familiar maybe with, uh, with the research are um, more familiar with what it does. Yeah, in this, uh, in this uh, particular experiment of the cardiomyocyte mo mosaic, we use tamoxifen to induce the Cree in, in that mice. And the thing is that we use the tamoxifen at very low doses just to recombine some of them, the, which is the way that we have to quantify the macrophages that are surrounded a single cardiomyocyte. Because in the mice, uh, cardiomyocytes are so tight uh, joined together that sometimes it's difficult to, to um, delineate or to identify a, a single cardiomyocyte. So it's the way that in which we achieve that. Good, good, okay. Um, so Aaron Scott, you have a question about animal models. Um, so why don't you go ahead and... Um, hi again, hi, um, hi Ango, that was brilliant. Really fantastic talk and an incredible body of work. Um, I was just curious, um, just from working in zebrafish myself um, in, in the heart, um, the, the density of macrophages seemed, re cardiac macrophages seemed really, really high. Um, so I just wondered how that kind of compares to other models, uh, larger animal models, or even human, if you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we didn't have access to, to human samples to perform this kind of analysis. We, we just have some samples to do transmission electron microscopy because they, they were fixed in the moment and they were not what you can call healthy donors. So it was just to check if we can detect something similar to, to cardiac exophors there. So about the density, what I can tell you is that uh, in the mouse, it's quite high uh, in the young adults, let's say. Uh, but uh, we are now analyzing what happens with time and the population of macrophages seems to decrease with aging uh, up to a 40, 30 percent, what uh, you can find in a young uh, specimen. So this can vary even in the same animal model with age. So um, I don't know what will happen in other animal models like pigs or, or what will happen in, in humans, but uh, I, I think that the, I will expect that the density is also, is also high. Our next question is from uh, Costanza Emanuele. Costanza, you had a couple of questions here, so um, you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd like. Yes, yes, I was fighting with my mic. Now <laughs> I find it. Thank you very much, it was a fantastic talk. A some curiosity also about the macrophages, uh, the origin, and also if you know what are uh, potentially the different subtypes that do the job of uh, taking the exosphere, and if you think that is something specific to macrophages, or maybe also the dendritic cells could do something similar. And just a very final question, if you expect that uh, in animal model of stress, like, I don't know, myocardial infarction of the, you know, heart failure, diabetic cardiomyopathy, to see something uh, even more uh, exacerbated. Finish, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I will try to answer all of them. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, we'll start by the origin. Uh, it has been, uh, uh, there was a lot of effort in the last year to characterize the origin of uh, uh, different tissue resident macrophages, but also the cardiac resident macrophages. It is known that they enter there even before uh, the animal is born. So they are from embryonic origin, but then they are progressively replaced by bone marrow derived monocytes uh, with, uh, with aging. Uh, we haven't found any differences in the incorporation or the capacity to phagocytose exophers uh, by the different uh, macrophage subtypes uh, that we have defined. So it seems that more or less all of them phagocytose the same. And uh, you ask also by other cell types like dendritic cells, um, and also I will say endothelial cells, some of them have been proposed to, to perform uh, or to be highly phagocytic. And what I will tell you is that I think that in the absence of macrophages that will be the professional phagocytos, uh, phagocytic cells in the, in the tissue, probably they will take charge of that. But the important thing of macrophages is that they can do a silent removal of this debris. So I think that the, the importance to have the macrophage there is that they reach the apoptotic cells before that the dendritic cells or that, that the material can get to the endothelial cells. 
probably dendritic cells can phagocytose them, but then they will generate inflammation. So that's why it's important that the macrophage uh, gets there and is efficient at removing all this and generating an anti-inflammatory response. And finally, for the stress, uh, I have skipped uh, some results that we have from this uh, in the paper just because of the of the time. But uh, in the paper, we use the 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 myocardial infarct that is not uh, I will say that is not the better model to take to look at this but we we look in the remote area of the of the infarct and there the there is an increase in the production of uh, cardiac uh, um, uh, exophers but also uh, we found an increase of cardiac exophers uh, by isoprenaline treatment isoprenaline is a beta adrenergic agonist drug that force the, card the, the cardiomyocyte to, to beat uh, very fast. And this uh, generates a lot of uh, stress to the mitochondria. And we see that in this context, we have much more cardiac exophers than in control mice. Thank you very much. Fantastic paper and very good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the questions, Costanza. And I think it's, um, it's difficult for people to limit themselves to one question on this paper, I think, because there's so many interesting things that are happening and, and indeed, um, our next, uh, our next uh, set of questions comes from uh, Jang. Jang, why don't you go ahead? We had talked a bit about the tamoxifen and why, why it was used, um, but you have some other, um, some other thoughts on the tamoxifen. Oh, great. Uh, it's, it's, it's very exciting to hear. It's, this is signature paper that I really, uh, really appreciate uh, to have this opportunity. Uh, so, so I have a few questions. I try to be precise and uh, concise. So the tamoxifen, uh, cardiac myocytes, very sensitive tamoxifen. Uh, so I'm just wondering, all this uh, addition, this surprising macrophage number, I can also mention that. Uh, do you think that's possible because tamoxifen, uh, compared like without tamoxifen, how, how this macrophage uh, always constantly around the heart? It's, it's, so that's very confusing, but it's very good observation. So I'm just wondering whether you have comments on this tamoxifen induced, if in the future you can validate that without tamoxifen. But another interesting, I really want to, uh, you to elaborate a little bit on uh, this very important cardiac phenotype, which is cardiac diastolic dysfunction with preserved ejection fraction. So which is a very important clinical question. So I'm wondering how this exo first role in that part, but you show clearly that this, um, um, mitochondria enriched protein inside. I'm wondering there's other functions, but basically I'm really uh, impressed by your work. Thank you. Thank you. So I will also try to, to answer these two. So about the tamoxifen, we just used tamoxifen in, in one experiment. Uh, so I, I, I am sorry if I was, I was not clear on that, which is the, the one of the cardiomyocyte mosaic. But uh, in the rest of the models, they are constitutive free, so there we do not use tamoxifen. And I am also aware of the effect that tamoxifen has on, uh, on different cell types. And we even consider to use tamoxifen as a stress inducer to check for differences in, in cardiac exophers. At the end, we didn't perform that experiment, but yeah, it will be, it will be nice to check. And uh, about the the phenotype that we observe in these mice and that you also say that is uh, clinically relevant, this uh, diastolic dysfunction with preserved ejection fraction is a phenotype that is also observed uh, with aging in, in, uh, in people that, uh, where, where the, the heart starts to fail. So it's uh, very interesting that when you eliminate uh, macrophages in the heart, the heart evolves to this, to this uh, let's, phenotype, let's say or this disease, uh, it will be a nice tool to, to check what is happening there with aging. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you for this very, uh, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I have three small questions. Uh, the first being, uh, besides their shape and their morphology, uh, did you test whether the uh, mitochondria within the exophers are functional? Uh, and the uh, second question would be, uh, are they oxidized or did you see changes in, um, in, uh, in mitochondrial uh, oxidation in general? And lastly, um, 
it's very interesting uh, for me because I work on uh, anti-mitochondrial antibodies in uh, autoimmune diseases. And uh, in uh, cardiovascular conditions, patients may develop anti-mitochondrial antibodies against uh, succinate uh, uh, dehydrogenase, so the ETC complex 2. Uh, did you see a difference of expression for this protein in your expression assay? Thank you. Yeah, very interesting, uh, th this last question. Uh, I, I I cannot tell you by heart. Uh, I should uh, have to check it. If you want to, to send me an, an email or mail me, I, I can check it for you if you're interested. And uh, about the other two questions, uh, the, uh, the functionality of mitochondrial exophores. Here we have the morphologic data, but also this uh, this data that I show in the presentation about the membrane potential with the mitonia, where we found that mitochondria uh, barely have mitochondrial potential. So in, in exophores, sorry, barely have mitochondrial potential, indicating that they are not uh, uh, functional. But also in the paper, we check uh, the citrate synthase activity is uh, very reduced. And I am not sure if we finally included it, but we have other, other data also showing that uh, the functional and enzymatic capacity of the mitochondria is very reduced. And about the mitochondria or ROS production, let's say, of uh, more oxidation of the proteins of mitochondria, uh, which are inside the exophores, uh, we have considered to measure this uh, back in the days. Uh, finally, we didn't, uh, we haven't done it. So I can tell you uh, really if, uh, if they are more or less oxidized. I will say that they will be more oxidized, but uh, really don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, great. Next is, is Prashun. Prashun Data. Uh, hello. Fantastic work mm -hmm. and a great talk. You know, the, the question I had for you is, are the ca cardiomyocytes inefficient in mitophagy or they don't do my, they don't have the function of mitophagy at all? And the second is, uh, the macrophage phenotype, are these M1 or M2 macrophages? Uh, I didn't understand the first one. Can you repeat the it? The first please? one is, are, they, are the cardiomyocytes generally inefficient in mitophagy? About the second one, uh, the macrophages uh, in homeostasis, the, so the, mac the population of macrophages residing in the myocardium will be more similar to an M2 anti-inflammatory phenotype. However, uh, we in the lab do not love too much this M2 and uh, one classification of macrophages because there are, I think that there are much more things going on there, but yeah, they will be more anti-inflammatory. And uh, about the mitophagy in cardiomyocytes, this is something very interesting because it seems that uh, cardiomyocytes are not able to get rid of all the, the mitophagy that they need to perform by their own. It seems that they, need to to relate or to how to say it to relegate part of this work to macrophages uh, you have to consider that cardiomyocyte to work uh, they have a very uh, reduced pool of atp that only lasts for two or three seconds so they are producing atp all the time that's why they need so much mitochondria in their cytoplasm and they need all their energy to maintain the heart beating so Probably if they had to, to take charge of all the material that they should uh, degrade through autophagy, regular autophagy mechanisms or mitophagy, that will be a real problem for the, for the cardiomyocytes. And that's why I think that they opt for this option of taking the, the trash out, just uh, pull, pull them out in this cardiac exophores and let the macrophages to, to do the, the cleaning. Um, we, we do have a few questions um, here that, that relate to some things that we often talk about in this journal club. Um, in fact, last week, we just had a paper about how we can tell the difference between exosomes that are coming from internal compartment of the cell and exosomes uh, that are budding from the plasma membrane. And so uh, Pasquale uh, Dacunzo has, a, has a, a couple of questions, um, but is a little worried about the microphone, which doesn't usually work from, uh, from the institution. So um, it... Uh, Pasquale notes that it, it seems that there's um, that that these these exophores are coming from in, from inside the cell. Is that correct, or are they budding from the plasma membrane? Uh, 
right now we really don't know. It seems more that it's budding from the plasma membrane that uh, uh, preform uh, autophagosome, let's say, that then is ejected to the to the media. So for me, it's in, it will be more similar to an ectosome. So it's produced in the membrane and it's uh, budding until it is uh, fully released to the to the media, which is also what it has been proposed for the exophores in neurons in the C. elegant paper that I that I showed you before. And then the the uh, follow up question to that is, you know, when the mitochondria are are released with these exophores. Are they not inside? And, and then if, if so, how are they uh, contributing to inflammation when they get to their, to their destination? Is there a breakdown of that membrane? Yeah, that, that's something that we do not have uh, clear data to demonstrate it. Uh, we have some, uh, uh, some examples that we have detected by analyzing our, our uh, samples. But it seems that first, when the exophore is released, the mitochondria and all the content is inside the membrane. It's a single membrane. You can look at them clear by the transmission electron microscope. But uh, what I think that happens when you don't have macrophages for long periods of time is that at some point, this membrane uh, is disrupted and the material inside the exophore is released to the media. And that's when the mitochondria can generate uh, inflammation. Yeah, you know, so we 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 have uh, talked about this with microRNAs as well. You know, so the microRNA that's inside the EV, how is it stimulating TLRs um, once the EV is is taken up into, you know, into into an internal compartment? So, so I think there's um, there, there's a lot of, of things that we don't don't completely grasp about how the membrane topology and the breakdown um, of these vesicles um, is is contributing to. Um, you know, the molecular interactions that then happen. And in fact, we had, we also had a question uh, from someone who's not on the, on the line anymore, um, but about what, um, you know, where else in the recipient cell, the, the components that are in the, um, in the exophores might be going. So I, I don't, I don't believe that you, you really looked at that. Is that correct? I, I didn't get your, your question, sorry. So is, is there any evidence of the exopher, you know, um, uh, uh, fusing with the recipient cell and delivering contents? No, it seems more that it is completely engulfed because uh, I have uh, found uh, several mononuclear cells that contain uh, the, the whole particle inside or being already uh, internalized. Mm -hmm. So all yeah. the both the membrane and the content. So I, I guess that, that relates then to Clotilde uh, Terry's question. Clotilde, do you want to you want to just go ahead with yours? Yeah. Hi, Ken. Thanks. Well, great job. Thanks. Um, and my my question was a bit uh, maybe uh, simple, but uh, I, I wonder how different the exophiles uh, would be from uh, apoptotic cell derived vesicles. Would they have a different composition? Because well, you highlighted that they are cap uh, captured phagocytos by MRTK. I was wondering whether the other uh, receptors for apoptotic cell uh, clearance are also involved, like MFG8, or and whether you could see a difference between exophia and apoptotic uh, derived vesicles, apoptotic cell derived vesicles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, I will say that the, the right now the only difference and the most important one will be the 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 source cell. So in one case the cell is alive and is doing this on purpose. And in the other case, the cell is dying. And uh, what you have is just a membrane with uh, cellular content inside. So uh, right now, one of the problems that we, that we have handling these particles is that we do not have a uh, membrane uh, markers to, to detect them without uh, uh, using the, the CARRED model, the one of the, the cardiomyocyte reporter. Uh, we have the phosphatidylserine, however, as you say, is not exclusive for, for them. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it will be nice to, to characterize this uh, further in, in the future, probably by is isolating the membranes specifically of the exophore, because in the proteomics that we did, mostly, most of the results that we get were from the, with the, the, the content of the exophore, but not the membrane. So it would be nice to, to do a more specific uh, analysis to, to detect these possible markers of, of exophores. And about the receptors in the macrophage, I would say that they are 
probably the same ones that the macrophage used to detect the apoptotic, uh, the apoptotic cells. In this case, we focus on the MERTK because we have the tools in the lab. But as you saw in the figures, um, it is not a total blunt. Uh, macrophages have several tools to recognize uh, apoptotic cells. And just by removing MERTK, you do not uh, block completely the, the, cap the, the phagocytic capacity of macrophages. But it seems to be uh, at least sufficient to generate problems to the, to the cardiac physiology. Thank you. Thank you. So um, a couple of related questions here. We have um, we have a question from Tyler Cooper who's not able to unmute. Um, but does uh, I is it possible? So you know, exophers have been described in uh, neurons and in, in, in a you know neuron setting, um, and here in the heart. Um, are do you think that exophor release is, is somehow related to metabolism? So these are you know organs where you would have relatively high. Uh, metabolism, or do you think that this is something that we're probably going to find in in a lot of places in the, in the mammalian body? Mm, yeah, this is a very nice question. We are also interested in exploring this further. Right now, the as you say, neurons and and cardiomyocytes is where they have been described, probably because they were the the better candidates to 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 use this kind of systems. But uh, one of the things because I. I think that uh, cardiomyocyte and neurons opt by this mechanism is because they are a very important cells, a mature, fully differentiated cells that are not easy to, to replace. So probably uh, they occupy a, a privileged uh, situation in the, in the organ and they have uh, the possibility to opt for this strategy and to have the uh, macrophage populations serving them to eliminate the materia. And uh, if you think about the cardiomyocyte, uh, as I said before, they are co continuously uh, producing ATP for to maintain the, the animal alive. They, they need to beat continuously. So they cannot uh, use part of their energy or dedicate the majority of their energy to get rid of damaged material. So they just have to for eliminating them by other ways. And in the case of the neurons, if you think in, for example, a neuron from the spinal cord that may have an axon that reaches the, the toe, uh, if you have a mitochondria that get damaged, uh, um, I don't know, in your feet, uh, I do not see a, a, that to move them back to the soma to be eliminated by mechanism inside the neuron will be the better option. I think that, uh, uh, this kind of uh, garbage, uh, garbage uh, bags that will be the, the exophers will be a better mechanism to eliminate the trash, whatever it is, to do not cause uh, problems to the cell. Because if you lose a neuron or if you lose a cardiomyocyte, it's a huge problem for the organism. So that's why I think uh, it will be restricted to these very, very important cells. But we have the example of the skeletal muscle that we are currently exploring, also a differentiated cell. It can be replaced. It's not super easy, but it can be replaced. And it seems that something is happening there too. So I, I cannot uh, guess if you could find exophers in other tissues. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, maybe some people on this journal club will, will keep looking. But I think that's a, that's a very um, uh, well-reasoned uh, response there and and I, I think too um, so Erez Erez has um, has uh, made us aware of this uh, publication in PNAS that came out uh, some time ago about how mitochondria can be transferred from neurons to astrocytes um, and this is a paper from Nick Marsh Armstrong's lab um, at, um, at also at Hopkins um, and so on a as a final Hopkins note here since this journal club started at Johns Hopkins I have Sam Das who has a question about um, about some knockout mice. Sam, go ahead and ask your question. Oh, hi. Uh, so yeah, it is a very Sam good- Sam I know, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I noticed your um, 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 proteomics data and I saw OPA1, but I did not see Parkin. But a couple of years ago, there was a paper of cardiac mitochondria clearance depending on parking from OSA, OSA's lab in UCSD. So I was just wondering whether you looked at these um, exo for release dependent on parking, whether you looked at any parking knockout mice or 
uh, any kind of you know uh, mm -hmm. park independence. But but you know during the discussion you discuss about your exoflora is not um, or you do not think it's a RAB5 dependent. But Osa's paper mainly focus on RAB5 dependent uh, vesicle, either microparticle or exosome. So uh, can you comment on that? This is very I mean, yeah. I, I got really excited about this project. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, the parking the parking thing was uh, in the top one of the things asked by the, the reviewers. The thing was, it was very difficult to achieve. Our mice were already, already a triple transgenic mice and to take the parking and to cross it with all the, all the things that we have to generate the car red mice, uh, it was quite difficult. And uh, even if it was uh, very interesting, it was not the main question that we have at that moment, not the most important thing for the paper to, to move on. So uh, that's why we did not pursue these results. But yeah, I think that uh, parking probably will be involved in the, the recruitment of mitochondria to, to the elimination system through, through cardiac exophers. Uh, in the proteomics, I do not mention parking because we, can, uh, we didn't find it. We didn't find it because in proteomics we only find the most abundant proteins, and uh, we just get, I, I, if I remember properly, it was like 3,500 proteins, and uh, parking is not very abundant in the tissue, so we we couldn't get it. I don't remember if RAF5 was there, but uh, I don't I don't think so. So yeah, uh, it would be nice if we had the tools in the future just to to check it because I. I think that the, probably the same mechanisms that act on mitophagy, autophagy in other uh, cell types will be also recruiting uh, damage material to the to the exophore formation. Yeah, thank you. Very good. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so and, and Tyler has given us a few other ideas like the eye, uh, where there are photoreceptors or long-lived stem cells. We might we might be able to see something like this happening in a few other places. So. So um, I think that brings us to the end of our hour for today. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and for the great discussion. Um, and most of all, Angel, thank you so much for this work. I know you put a lot of, a lot of time and effort into this, and we also appreciate your coming out today um, to share it with the EV Journal Club. So thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And I hope that you all have a good rest of the week, and we'll see you again soon.